Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Isaiah. And we have come to the very last st lesson on the book of Isaiah. We'll cover just a little bit of the 63 and 64, but mostly talking about 65 and 66, which are talking about the future about some promises of what's going to happen. So I think you'll find it very interesting. This is our lesson for March 27 of 2021. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come now once again to open the inspired record to learn more about you and how you dealt with some of your friends so long ago who were misbehaving in various ways. Help us to learn from these lessons what you want us to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 63 through 66 are chapters in which Isaiah not only saw or perhaps heard from God about the future return of exiles from Babylon, but also the elimination of sin and the final return of God to live with humanity. What will God do with the righteous and with the wicked at that time? That's the question we ultimately need to know. Jim, do you have something on that? Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. O Lord said, excuse me, the Lord says, I am making a new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. The new Jerusalem I make will be full of joy and her people will be happy. I myself will be filled with joy because of Jerusalem and her people. There will be no weeping there, no calling for help. Babies will no longer die in infancy, and all people will live out their lifespan. Those who live to be a hundred will be considered young. To die before that would be a sign that I had punished them. People will build houses and live in them themselves. They will not be used by someone else. They will plant vineyards and enjoy the wine. It will not be drunk by others. Like trees, many pe my people will, be, will live long lives. They will fully enjoy the things that they have worked for. The work they do will be successful and their children will not meet with disaster. I will bless them and their descendants for all time to come. Even before they finish praying to me, I will answer their prayers. Wolves and lambs will eat together. Lions will eat straw, as cattle do, and snakes will no longer be dangerous. On Zion, my sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Wow, and you recognize those last two verses are basically verbatim of the last three verses of, of well, actually Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. So now, you might have noticed something in there that seems a little confusing, a little contradictory. Verse 25 seems to be talking about a time when all sin will be gone, animals will be transformed, and we will be living in a world made new. However, not everything is completely new. People are apparently still dying even though at a very advanced age. So what are we supposed to conclude from this passage? Charles? Isaiah 65, 17. We're going to repeat one of those verses and we're going to ask some questions about it. The Lord says, I'm making a new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. Is that really true? How does that statement fit with the fact that there are many passages in the writings of Ellen White, and not to mention the Bible, we could quote those as well, suggesting that the plan of salvation will be studied for the rest of eternity. Carrie? The death of Christ upon the cross made sure the destruction of him who has the power of death, who was the originator of sin. When Satan is destroyed, there will be none to tempt to evil. The atonement will never need to be repeated, and there will be no danger of another rebellion in the universe of God. Okay, let's stop, and before we come to this, the, the key passage here, why would that be true? Why is it that 
the death of Christ makes it impossible, makes it for it never for it never to happen again. Sin will never rise up. Why not? He'll he'll not take a chance. He'll take only the ones who have proven ah maybe salvation by works. <laughs> <laughs> that no, I, the I, affliction I, shall not rise up the second time. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Yeah. Let, let me inter introduce a, a hypothetical situation. Okay? Suppose a billion years from now, God goes, he starts to recreate, and he, he, he creates some new worlds. He's been making worlds. Why should he stop? The, and the reason he doesn't make any new worlds right now is because as soon as he made a new world with new people, guess who would demand to be there? Satan. Of course, Satan would demand to be there. So God says, no, I'm not going to take that risk. I'm not going to mess with him again. So when this is all done, Satan is gone. Then God, I think, will go back to creating. Well, just suppose one of those people sometime in the future should decide to rebel. And God would say, hold on you, come and sit down here. I want you to watch what happened the last time someone tried that. He would see the whole panorama of the great controversy when he greeted it in. And if that person at the end of all that still decides to go on his perverse way, God will simply gather us all around and say, this person here has chosen to rebel. What do you think I should do? And we will say simply, leave him. Just step back. Because as soon as you leave him, he's dead. Yeah. There's no reason for us to do that again. We all know what happened. We know the story. There's no reason for it to happen again. So that's my hypothetical answer to that. Okay, Kerry, go ahead. Now I've got to stop and think where I was. That, that which, alone? which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. Notice that's will prevent. That's future. Yes. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by the saints and angels. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, so the only reason we're able to go there is because of what Jesus did. Now, we could spend a lot of time discussing that, but go ahead. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. What does that mean? It is through the efficacy of the cross yeah. that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, they can, they can make choices too. That's what's done. Yeah, off early okay, on. exactly. So, if they were ever tempted again, they would say, we have seen where that's going to lead to. We're never going down that path again. Okay? Yeah. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in even the paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation making manifest the justice and love of God provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. It provides what? An eternal safeguard. safeguard. The plan of salvation will be the lesson book of the universe. Uh, may I? Yeah. Christ will always have his body. That uh, itself is perhaps more than enough for anyone want to rebel. Yeah. And those marks on his hands will always be there. So mm -hmm. I really truly really doubt that people will ever want to question any longer. Yeah. Our only hope is perfect trust in the blood of him who can save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. Now, I'm going to interrupt again. I'm sorry for all the interruptions. Right. When we talked, our, is perfect trust in the blood, does this have something to do with red blood cells and white blood cells? What do we mean by trust in the blood? This is, this, is, this is a huge issue in Christianity. 
Yeah. It's talking about the meaning of the cross. Yeah. That's what we're talking about there. Okay. The death of Christ on the cross of Calvary is our only hope in this world, and it will be our theme in the world to come. And that comes from Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, paragraph 4. And those of you who are familiar with the history of the Adventist Church, you will remember that that came just One year. very shortly after that famous 1888 General Conference. What kind of transformation will be necessary for lions to eat straw like cattle or, an, or the ox? <laughs> this, is, this is a complete transformation. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there's, there's no question about the fact that lions' guts are going to have to, I mean, they're, they're, their upgraded. tummies are going to have to be very different than they are now, that's for sure. Upgraded. <laughs> In effect, Isaiah was giving us a step-by-step -step introduction to how things will be in the future. May, may I? Yeah. Um, people say this is nuts, that this will not happen. By the way, uh, I could tell stories, perhaps you folk also know, that yes, there are lions who are totally vegetarians. Yeah. Their guts there do get longer. Right. Yeah. So it is possible it's not something that's being spoken. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Well, we do not know exactly at what time during his life Isaiah wrote these passages. The fact that they are located at the end of the book of Isaiah suggests that they came later in his ministry. Remember that when Isaiah was about 45 years old, the Assyrians, we've already talked about this, surrounded Jerusalem after having conquered all the rest of the nation and told the people of Jerusalem that it, would, it was just a matter of time before they would be destroyed. And remember the story as recorded in Isaiah 37. And what happened at the end of that story? They survived. They survived. Who didn't survive? The Assyrians. 185,000 Assyrians surrounded Jerusalem. What would you do with 185,000 dead Assyrians? I've often wondered that, that. As far as we know, they never had bulldozers. Must have taken somebody well, a lot of work. I read some the other day that in Mosul, uh, Iraq, there's still dead bodies out there that have never been picked up after the after really? four years. Wow. Also, a lot of Christians there. Yeah. Some. Were, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lot. Were, yeah. There were a lot. Yeah. If you had lived through that kind of experience, would the language we read here seem more appropriate? But God lamented that things were not going the way they should have been going, and so now he's going to give us some very strange language. Isaiah 66 verses 3 to 19. The Lord said, the people do as they please. Now that's not so strange. Unfortunately, that's far too common. Yeah. It's all the same to them whether they kill a bull as a sacrifice or sacrifice a human being. Whoa, 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 whoa hold on. Sacrificing human beings? Some of them were doing that. Yeah. Whether they sacrifice a lamb or break a dog's neck. Huh? whether they present a grain offering or offer, or offer pig's blood. This is completely against the Jewish system. Whether they offer incense or pray to an idol, they take pleasure in disgusting ways of worship. Think of all the fertility cult stuff and so forth. So I will bring disaster upon them, the very things they are afraid of, because no one answered when I called or listened when I spoke. They chose to disobey me and do evil. Listen to what the Lord says, you that fear him and obey him. Because you are faithful to me, some of your own people hate you and will have nothing to do with you. They mock you and say, let the Lord show his greatness and save you so that we may see you rejoice. But they themselves will be disregarded. Disgraced. Disgraced. I'm sorry. Thank you. Listen. That loud noise in the city, that sound in the temple, is the sound of the Lord punishing his enemies. Now, what do you think is happening there? The sound in the temple is the sound of the Lord punishing his enemies. What was going on in the temple at that point in time, do you know? I don't think it was being run like it should have. They run at a brothel. There was some pretty. Yeah. They were. Things remember, was, right? This earlier, we right. earlier in Isaiah, he said, yeah. "Come, break a hole in the wall. Look inside." And there's those people. I mean, it was Ezekiel actually. Yeah. 
they were they were worshiping fertility gods and all that kind of nonsense and getting drunk and so forth inside of Solomon's temple. Yeah. Inside of Solomon. Well, you mentioned once Solomon himself uh, sacrificed, sacrificed his own son. So it don't need to go down too far. No. But Ahaz was perhaps one of the worst, worst kings ever. The Lord says, I will bring you lasting prosperity. God, God offers this. The wealth of the nations will flow to you like a river that never goes dry. You'll be like a child that is nursed by its mother, carried in her arms and treated with love. I will comfort you in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. When you see this happen, you'll be glad. It will make you strong and healthy. Then you will know that I, the Lord, help those who obey me, and I show my anger against my enemies. Okay, do we know what God's anger is? Mm -hmm. Let you do what you had a mind to do. And you will reap the results. The reap the results of your own behavior. But it isn't imposed by God. No. It's just the way life works. Yeah. The Lord will come with fire. He will ride on the wings of a storm to punish those he's angry with. By fire and sword, he will punish all the people of the world whom he finds guilty, and many will be put to death. But you know, it doesn't say God does it, does it? It doesn't say that. Really? The Lord says, the end is near for those who purify themselves for pagan worship, who go in procession to sacred gardens, and who eat pork and mice and other disgusting foods. I know their thoughts and their deeds. I am coming to gather the people of all the nations. When they come together, they will see what my power can do and will know that I am the one who punishes them. But this is good news Bible. You're sure it's not written by the Adventists? No. So they, 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 whoever translated this saying pork and mice, maybe right they should there. have changed it a little bit, right? <laughs> That's what it says there. So what is God through Isaiah trying to tell us in these verses? Read superficially, it might sound like God was becoming upset and was determined to wipe out his enemies. But we know from all the rest of Scripture that God's wrath, his anger, is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. I think this is the take-home message right there, what you just read it. Yeah. This is a take-home message. Yes. God's wrath is simply as turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. You know, in fact, what he's doing is honoring your choice. Yeah. You want to go that way? Well, I've done everything I'm I sorry. can to try to get your attention. I'll weep about it. Yeah. Yeah. But in these passages, we do see God's love for those who obey him in contrast to those who are still evildoers. Jim? Through the prophet, God reiterates the appeal and warning that permeates the book. God will save and restore the humble who tremble at his word. Isaiah 66, verses 2 and 5. As in Isaiah 40, verse 1, he will comfort them. Isaiah 66, 13. But he will destroy those who rebel against him. These include hypocrites of ritual whose sacrifices he rejects. Isaiah 66, 3 and 4. And compare Isaiah 1, 10 to 15. As well as those who hate and reject his faithful ones. Isaiah 66, 5. They also include those who practice pagan abominations. Isaiah 66, 17. Such as those practiced at the temple in Jerusalem, Ezekiel 8, 7 to 12. And that's the passage I was, yeah, that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. The Ezekiel 8 passage is the one I was talking about. But what you see here is that Isaiah is pulling ideas from things that he's written before, and he's putting them here in these last couple of chapters as kind of a summary. However, once again, we need to remember to put all of these statements by Isaiah and Ezekiel here in the historical context in which they took place. And what was that historical context, Charles? Second Kings 17, 18 to 20. The Lord was angry with the Israelites and banished them from his sight, leaving only the kingdom of Judah. But even the people of Judah did not obey the laws of the Lord their God. 
they imitated the customs adopted by the people of Israel, the Lord rejected all the Israelites, punishing them and handing them over to the cruel enemies until at last he had banished them from his sight. Comment. These are 10 tribes. Yeah. So let's say at the time, this is what, about 600 years before Christ? So about 20, 700. 700. So about 25, 2700 years ago? Yes. If there were 100,000 Israelites, mm -hmm. could it be safe to even think that there are probably 10 million people who are really Jews, but they are no longer Jews? And Maybe. They're Maybe all kinds of other Maybe people. Maybe they've so. integrated with all the other kinds of people, yeah. But that their descendants are still there. Yeah. Who are God's chosen people. Yep. Well, of course, this is a Zionist movement. Uh, the British at one time and back in, before World War II had this huge Zionist movement that claimed that many of the, those 10 tribes had actually gone to England and so forth and established there. But, there's still an so, organization for that now, right yeah. here. Yeah. So what were the people doing? Look again at Isaiah 66, verse 3. The people do as they please. It's all the same to them, whether they kill a bull as a sacrifice or sacrifice a human being, whether they sacrifice a lamb or break the do a dog's neck, while, whether they pre present a grain offering or offer pig's blood, whether they offer incense or pray to an idol. They take pleasure in disgusting ways of worship. Wow. What do you think God should have done with people who are behaving like that? Well, I think, I think it depends. I just thought of something that's not mentioned there. You go to the highlands of New Guinea. Yeah. Those people used to kill. That was a way of life. They've got big yeah. buildings full of skulls. They don't know any different. That's why we've had missionaries trying to turn that around. Yeah. Well, I unfortunately had the let's say, unfortunate privilege of traveling through Uganda shortly after Idi Amin was chased, oh. chased out. And you go into classrooms, yes, cl former school classrooms, and a whole corner of the classroom is filled with skulls. Yes. And you go, I was, I was there in, in Rwanda, not long after that genocide happened there. And you go to buildings, I mean, piled, yes. piled with skulls and bones and things like this. And, the basement of churches just choo, 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 choo. Yeah. And he was let li live in Arabia somewhere, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he should have been shot. Yeah. yeah, well, through this all, it bleeds the Creator's heart. Yeah. yeah. How can I give you up, Israel? But you're and, bent on leaving me, so yeah. Yeah. he honors your choice. And Isaiah 66, verses 18 and 19, let's look at that really quick. I know that, that there are thoughts I know their thoughts and their deeds. I am coming to gather the people of all the nations. When they come together, they will see what my power can do and will know that I am the one who punishes them. Wow, punishes them? You know, let me go back. A As we started, some folk might have a question where it talks about a child growing up, someone living to be 100. Maybe you could make... Uh, well, th this... This is Isaiah thinking of the situation in which he lived in those days. I mean, if you survive past a few years old, I mean, the young men were being killed off and so forth like this. This kind of, this is the kind of thing that, that was amazing to them. But, uh, but he's talking really about the new earth. But ultimately, so he's, he's contrasting that. He's kind that of mixing, mixing it. Yeah. You see, that's what I'm pointing. Yeah. He's not talking about the... New yeah. heaven and new earth, because there is no death. Yeah. But he's talking about what's really going on during that time of mm -hmm. his life and so Okay, thank you. So those verses 18 and 19 suggest that not everything will be evil. It is possible that God will actually draw people as if he, as if he were a magnet. Looking back at Isaiah 2, 2 and 4, In days to come, the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest one of all. Towering above all the hills, many nations will come streaming to it. 
and there people will say, let us go up the hill of the Lord to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk on the paths he has chosen, for the Lord's teaching comes from Jerusalem. From Zion, he speaks to his people. He will settle disputes among great nations. They will hammer their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. And of course, if you remember Joel 3, 10, it talks about doing just the opposite. opposite. The nations will never again go to war, never prepare for battle again. And so, um, what comes next here? Isaiah 55, Kerry? I will be reading verses 12 through 13. The Lord said, You will leave Babylon with joy. You will be led out of the city in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into singing, and the trees will shout for joy. Cypress trees will grow where now there are briars. Myrtle trees will come up in place of thorns. This will be a sign that will last forever, a reminder of what I, the Lord, have done. And that's from the Good News Bible. Well, but this passage seems to be clearly referring to the return from exile in Babylon. So, do we have other places in the Bible where events in the near future were mixed up with events far Yes, in the, the Lord from straight from his mouth. Right. Uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. So here we have a predecessor. Yes. Only Matthew you said 2%, about 2% of people returned. Mm -hmm. And this is talking about the 2% yeah, of the people. Yeah, returned, returned from Babylon. That's right. The others thought, we have a little comfortable life here and, and why should we go back? Mm. Yeah. And many of those Jews remained in Iraq and Iran until just recently. Even today, in, in, in um, Iran, um, Iran's capital, um, there are Jews who have their rights. They're, they're practicing yeah. and they're It's becoming more and more difficult for them, and so many of them are left. Many but, of them. Yeah. but they've been there for thousands of years. That's right. We might be able to guess that while there were some who will remain faithful to God or who will remain faithful to God among the people of Judah, those who choose or chose to worship in all those other ways would mock them and make fun of them. Do we, do we find it surprising that people make, will mock uh, others who are worshiping God? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 65 verse 5 says, Listen to what the Lord says, you that fear Him and obey Him. Because you are faithful to me, some of your own people hate you and will have nothing to do with you. They mock you and say, let the Lord show his greatness and save you so that we may see you rejoice. But they themselves will be disgraced. And that reminds me of a place in Jerusalem. Have you heard about the place in Jerusalem where there's a huge wall? Wailing wall? No, 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 that's not the wailing wall. There's a place in Jerusalem where there's a very, very conservative group of, of Jews that wear all the traditional garb and very conservative about keeping the Sabbath and so forth. And this wall is to keep them separate so they don't see all the other Jews breaking the Sabbath. They used to throw stones at them. So... Are those who worship God faithfully and follow biblical principles being mocked and derided in our day? How many people today take seriously the first 11 chapters of Genesis? I got a question. What percentage would you say in our world that think that the story of, of creation and the story of the flood is real? Very few, even perhaps among Adventists. Yeah. What about the Jews? And I wondered this, uh, and there's one or two organizations dealing with this as now as we talk about it. Survivors of uh, the Nazi death camps. Yeah. There's a lot of them that survived to this day are living in Russia. Mm -hmm. And they're starving Some. to death. And what you wonder. Uh, the, they obviously are not with them. A lot of the ones that I've seen pictures of are, are older people and are living mm -hmm. in. You wouldn't put your dog in some of the houses they're living in. Mm -hmm. And so their pension is not much good there, but where do these folk fit in? Yeah. God has great plans for his people. Jim? Isaiah 66, verses 19 to 21. 
but I will spare some of them and send them to the nations and the distant lands that have not heard of my fame or seen my greatness and power to Li Spain, Libya, and Lydia. With Where's its... Lydia? All you geographers and ancient ancient geographers? Guess Macedonia, maybe? Lydia was, was what is a portion of what we now call Western Turkey. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. With its skilled archers and Tubal and Greece. It is an L, right? Yeah, Tubal. Yeah. Amongst these nations, they will proclaim my greatness. They will bring back all your fellow Israelites from the nations as a gift to me. They will bring them to my sacred hill in Jerusalem on horses, mules, and camels, and in chariots and wagons, just as Israelites bring grain offerings to the temple in ritual clean containers. I will make some of them priests and Levites. Okay, now we're going to we're going to have a question about how to interpret this passage. Notice verse 20 there. They will bring back all of your fellow, fellow Israelites. Yeah. Does that mean people who have been scattered, they were Jews and they've scattered? Or does it mean a different group? That's why I brought it up a minute ago. I've thought about that on and off. Jim, you want to read us the next section there? God sends survivors of his destruction out to the ends of the earth, to people who do not know about God, and they shall redeclare my glory among the nations. Isaiah 66, 19 from the RSV, in New Revised Bystander Version. This is one of the clearest Old Testament statements on the theme of missionary outreach. In other words, not only are people to be drawn to the Hebrew nation, but also some of the Hebrew people will go to other nations and teach them about the true religion. A true God. A true God, excuse me. Yeah. A paradigm that is explicit in the New Testament. Though there were Jewish missionary outreach between the time of return from exile and to the time of Christ, that is in Matthew 23, 15, the early Christians spread the gospel rapidly and on a massive scale, Colossians 1, 23. Um, uh, that's guide. from Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. So now, here's the question. Are these Jews going out there and bringing other Jews, or are they also bringing Gentiles? Mostly Gentiles. Well, does this remind you of anything? Might these words be referring to what happened with the disciples and the apostles after Jesus ascended to heaven? That's exactly what happened, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Repeatedly, Paul appealed to his believing Christian friends to reach out to those around them. Of course, that was what Paul himself did. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So then, my brethren and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is true worship that you should offer. Good News Bible. Another surprising thing that God said is found in Isaiah 66, verse 21. Gary? I will make some of them priests and Levites, and that's from the Good News Bible. Oh. Who are the people being referred to in this verse? There seems to be some confusion about who was involved. The previous verses talked about bringing your kindred or your fellow Israelites back from other nations. But notice that the Bible study guide says the them in Isaiah 66, 24, 21 refers to your kindred from all the nations in the previous verse. These are Gentiles some of whom God would choose as worship leaders along with the priests and Levites. This is a revolutionary change. God previously had authorized only descendants of Aaron to serve as priests and only other members of the tribe of Levi to assist them. Gentiles could not literally become descendants of Aaron or Levi, but God would authorize some to serve in those capacities which have previously been forbidden even to most Jews. And that's a comment from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. So, what does this mean here? Um, you're kindred from among the nations? Does that mean they come from, these, these are people who come from among the nations, or does it mean other Jews that have been out there? That's the question. 
Uh, well, I've got an active mind right now. They're coming from other nations. Yeah. There's an organization was started by a rabbi in Chicago. He died late last year. His daughter has taken it over. Mm -hmm. And she takes and she deals mostly with Russia up through there. And once or twice a year, they, they bring them uh, boxes with a month's worth of food. Some of these elderly people, they look like they're ready to die. They're that bad. Mm -hmm. And also along with this, I think once a year, if they get enough money raised, they bring a plane load back from some of these places like that to Israel, direct. Really? Yeah, uh, uh, it's going on. And, yeah. It's talking even, the, I, I think here, in addition to what you just said, is talking about uh, what has happened after AD 34. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see, people from all over the world, in fact, uh, this might sound very revolutionary, but I believe a day is coming when uh, these priests are not going to be only um, bap um, dedicated or chosen by the church pastors. Yeah. That uh, the day is coming, uh, yeah. perhaps very soon. Well, notice this very interesting passage. So one passage from the Old Testament and one passage of the New Testament. Compare them. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now this is, they have camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, God is just about ready to descend on the mount, give the commandments, and give them all those sorts of other rules and laws. He's going to be up there for a couple of months at least, up on top of that mountain. So he's coming down, he's talking to Moses, he's getting ready, just getting that all set up. So Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, mm. a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. How many of the Jews were involved with that? At that time, only Levites. Well, I hold on. This is all. This is before the Levites were chosen. Okay, yeah. Because yeah, that, 19. the Levites were chosen after the da dancing around the dunk, yeah. drunk and naked around the golden calf. This yeah. is before that. He says, all of you Jews will be my priests. Okay, well, but look at 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Peter expanded that calling to include many more. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests. Um, I guess that's yours, Carrie. Okay. Uh, 1 Peter 2, and I'll be reading verses 9 and 10. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Now let me interrupt for a second. Who's he talking to? But you. Everyone. Every He's believer. talking to all the Christians. Every believer. All the believers, all the Christians, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. All right. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy, and that's from the Good News Bible. So what is Peter saying? Back there, God called all of the Jewish people. Then, because of events that happened, he narrowed down the priesthood. To, and the, the, to the Levites. And then he narrowed it even more to the descendants of Aaron. But now what's happening? He's expanding it again. He's saying, I want to include all believers, right? Yeah. So going back to Isaiah now, was Isaiah seeing in prophetic vision the spreading of the gospel to the whole world? Yes. It sounds like it. Yes. That would be quite remarkable as a statement from Old Testament times. Yeah. But these ideas fit perfectly with many passages in the New Testament. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts 26, 20, First in Damascus and in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and among the Gentiles, I preach that they must repent of their sins and turn to God and do the things that would show they had repented. So that's everybody, right? And Galatians 3, 28 and 29 makes it very clear. 
So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. Does that mean we're all capable of serving as priests? If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Okay, Jim, you want to pick up there with Colossians? Colossians 3, 11. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves, and free. But Christ is all. Christ is in all. Good News Bible. 1 Timothy 3.16 No one can deny how great it is the secret of our religion. He appeared in human form, was shown to be right by the Spirit, and was seen by angels. He was he was preached among the nations, was believed in, believed in throughout the world, and was taken up to heaven. Good news, Bible. Believed in throughout the world. How many does that include? All. Everywhere. Doesn't this suggest that all men and women were created equal in God's sight, and that all are called to be a part of the royal priesthood? Yep. Barriers have been broken down, and everyone is living in love and fellowship. So when will this prophecy of Isaiah be fulfilled? Not today or tomorrow. <laughs> how does that come about, though? How, do, how does it, the, the love and, and uh, fellowship going to come about? Just through force, intimidation, no, no, coercion, no. or a magic trick? No, none. no none of those. None of those. Is it only through education, is yeah. it not? Only through people learning about God, loving his character, loving his message, and then committing themselves, said, I'd rather be like this than die. I well, mean, uh, even, if, even if I was threatened with death. This is the death. biggest challenge uh, for us, the Adventists all over the world. What kind of a picture do we paint of our Heavenly Father mm -hmm. to the people we go out to? What if you teach, uh, tell them that uh, if you don't do, God, do it God's way, he's going to kill you? Yeah. Or he's going to roast you on a spit in the sky by and by forever. for a period forever. I mean, what a terrible picture that, that the Bible has presented. <laughs> and then you fortunately have, if you study the book of Job, if you've analyzed what the friends were saying, as opposed to what Job was saying, friends ultimately says that uh, God punishes and God destroys. Well, if that is, if those are lies that God referred to in, in uh, Job uh, 42, 42, 7 and 8, mm -hmm. and that's the old bo oldest book in the Bible, then why do you do we re read the rest of the Bible and then we find to Jeremiah 8, verse 8, the scribes have made it into a lie. Yeah. And then Jesus, Matthew 23, says, hey, what won't you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites? Seven times he said that. that was, isn't seven times a, a significant number? Several times. I don't, didn't count it. It is seven times. <laughs> you know, it's seven, it's seven times I counted them. Did any of the Jews living in Jerusalem complain about these ideas when they first heard them from Isaiah? No, we're the chosen people, right? <laughs> Remember what Paul said in Romans 11, 17, and 18, Charles? That some of the branches of the cultivated olive tree have been broken off. And... The branch of a wild olive tree has been joined to it. You Gentiles are like that wild olive trees. And now you share the strong spiritual life of the Jews. So then, you must not despise those who are broken off like branches. How can you be proud? You are just a branch. You don't support the roots. The roots support you, goodness Bible. <laughs> in the light of the cross, in the light of the Gospel Commission, why is any kind of spiritual or ethnic, even political elitism so abhorrent in the sight of God? Look closely at yourself. And are you harboring the sense of spiritual or ethnic superiority? If so, repent. I love this. <laughs> Now, we Adventists would never say, we have the truth, right? <laughs> we have done it throughout the years. We've been very fortunate, though. We've had the help of 
Ellen White to, to give yeah. us some insights into uh, and help us understand a better uh, picture of God. Yeah. Well, I think if you look at, uh, I'm going to bring up another matter. If you look at Sabbath afternoon, well, pretty well, as soon as what we're doing there, I go on to 3ABN. Mm -hmm. We are all over the world now. You could go to parts of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Singapore, all through South America, Maranatha, all this stuff. And there's people from all nations all over the place. Mm -hmm. And we start out how we've been taught to all these years, at least is what I remember. We teach them if they can read, we'll get their own Bible if we can. Some of the South American company, countries, they're lucky to have one page out of the Bible. Mm. Same goes for up around India. We're in there. But what we are doing overall, we are trying to educate them. Uh, in a language either their own or, or English because it fits in with a lot of what we are doing but not it's not exclusive and uh, you go uh, go up through Bangladesh and even parts of India you know that either Thomas or Matthew went there because we just recently bought a church from a Christian group that was yeah. supposed to have come from one of these guys yeah. so we are following it up we're teaching them, and we've got, we've got orphans coming from all over the place. Yeah. And, and they teach them the rudiments of school. And our schools are so good now over in these countries that non-believers want their kids to go there. Yeah. Because they, and they've got girls and guys who want to be teachers, want to be nurses and stuff. So I mean, yeah. it's going on now. Yeah. So now, let me bring up another question in the few minutes we have left. What are these new moon festivals mentioned in Isaiah 66, 23? Let me just read that verse. Uh, on every new moon festival, there it is, and every Sabbath, so new moon festivals and Sabbaths are mentioned side by side, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Okay? What are those new moon festivals? There are no new moon, new moon celebrations mentioned in the scriptures as legitimate days of worship. How many? None. None. But we know that in the earth made new, in the new Jerusalem, there will be a tree of life, or perhaps trees of life, suggested by Ezekiel, which will yield a new form of fruit every month. Is that the context in which there will be new moon celebrations? Well, we don't know. What we do know is Revelation 22.2. Jim? The flowing down the middle of the city street, on each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit 12 times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Now, have you ever thought about uh, even not not, mention, not mentioning angels or any of the rest of the beings of the universe at all, but just all the people who are going to be saved from this earth, getting fruit from one tree? No, there are trees all along. Well, yeah, that's what Ezekiel right. says. So uh, yeah. this is probably more than one tree. But for the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Yeah. Those might be coin, and there's not going to be any mosquitoes, by the way. So. No. Like but the drugs from, come from leaves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For many years, the Seventh-day Adventists have, highly re have rightly used Isaiah 66, 23 as an argument against eternally burning hell. But read the full three verses surrounding it. Isaiah 66, 22 to 24, just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem. I guess that's the holy city that we're yes. all going to go yes. from Sabbath to Sabbath and from new moon to new moon. Says the Lord, as they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. Now let's, let's stop for just a second. Yes, sir. What is it they're looking out at? I mean, we're going to follow this sequence. We're going to talk about it for a moment. I just want to be very clear. What are they seeing out there? Dead bodies. Dead bodies, okay. 
The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The signs of them will be disgusting to the whole human race. Do you think Isaiah was thinking about the 185,000 Assyrians? Could be. <laughs> Somebody had to get rid of them. Was he remembering what had happened to those Assyrians outside Jerusalem? What was done with the 185,000 dead bodies? Yes. Look at this passage, Isaiah 37, 36. An angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay all dead. Now, if you don't do something, you're going to have one gigantic smell very quickly. What yes. time of the year was that? We don't know. You kind of should wish it would be in the summertime when, the, when it's hot well, so you could uh, mummify the bodies. <laughs> well, <laughs> Otherwise you're going to have... Well, you look at history, the more recent history, most of the big uh, wars, they didn't start them in the middle of winter. They might have started later on or got embroiled in it, but it was usually in good weather. Hot enough to make a mess. Well, is that possibly what Isaiah was thinking about when he wrote this final message to God's people about the final end of the wicked and the final reward of the righteous? There they were, safe inside the city, and outside were those 185,000 dead Assyrians. Notice that in Isaiah 66, verse 22, he had already said that the righteous will continue forever. So why do you suppose Isaiah ended with that awful passage in Isaiah 66, 24? Doesn't that seem... I mean, think, we're talking about the gospel prophet here, right? Yeah. We've talked about that right through the book, and he's bringing good news. But he does say, let's be honest, he says, God will reward those who do what? Obey and keep his commandments, and he will punish those who well, rebel against him, right? Yeah. Did the people of Jerusalem try to go out and bury those 185,000 Assyrian soldiers? Or was this picture with worms eating them and fire burning them a very real picture in their minds? Well, maybe somebody told them to stay away because they sure would have gotten a disease somewhere pretty quick. Boy. In any case, it is important to notice that what is being... Well, and think about the fact that you've got, you've got bodies bloating up and so forth like that. They would burn. Yes, yes. And you know, worms and fire. You would do. You would. You'd have to do everything you possibly could to get rid of them. Yes. Um, in any case, it is important to notice that what is being destroyed are not people who are alive, but dead corpses. And we need to remember that at the end of time, the wicked will be separated from God and die in His very presence. When will that happen? Any time. Third. Coming. At the third coming, remember? Oh, yes. We're going to see, we're going to see Jesus crowned and, and, and you know, yeah. crowned basically. They're high and lifted up above the New Jerusalem, and then the glory of God is going to spread out, the, 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 and then there'll be that panorama. And even Satan himself, Philippians 2, will be down on his knees saying, God, you did every, everything you could possibly have done. I was thinking more of the forerunner. We've had several bad earthquakes we've had yeah. volcanoes blowing their lid <laughs> yeah. we need to remember that at the end of time the wicked will be separated from god and die in, <clears throat> in his very presence the fire that consumes the wicked will be god's glory which is poured out for the destruction of sin sinners death disease evil etc in the process of remaking this earth into a new garden of eden God's glory will be life for the righteous. And we don't have time to turn to it right now, but Ellen White says in two places in Desire of Ages, page 600 and page 107, that the, life, the, the, the light of God's glory, which gives life to the righteous, will do what? Destroy the wicked. Good, yeah. So how do you understand Revelation 20, verses 9 and 10? They spread out over the earth and surround the camp of God's people on the city that he loves. But fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Oh boy. Are we back to that here? 
<laughs> What's this forever and ever stuff? Seven hundred years before Jesus came to this earth, Isaiah had given us a promise of eternal life. The second coming and ultimately the third coming of Jesus is spelled out in much more detail in the New Testament is the Christian's great hope. Remember, there was no reason for Jesus to have come the first time if he's not going, not planning to come back again and take the righteous to live with him forever. So what about 2 Peter 3, 10, and 10 to 14, which we have learned from the last verses of Isaiah 66? How does that compare? Uh, I think we have time to read this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And this is 10 to 14. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. And so, my friends, as you wait for that day, do your best to be pure and faultless in God's sight and to be at peace with Him. Here in Isaiah, we find God not only restoring the kingdom to the people, but also expanding it to include the entire earth. This is much more than just a return from the Babylonian captivity. In Isaiah 64 and 65, we see that God reaches out to us as His children. Uh, I don't have time to read all that. He talks about, I permitted myself to be sought, I permitted myself to be found. Then God himself said, here am I, here am I, I have spread out my arm, my hands all day long. In all of these chapters, it seems clear that God is pictured not only as the one who saves his faithful children, but also as the one who punishes or destroys his enemies. And the Lord will come with fire. He will know to ride on the wings of a storm to punish those he's angry with. By fire and sword, he will punish all the people of the world whom he finds, guilt, finds guilty, and many will be put to death. Well, we don't have time to read all this too carefully, but I do want to point out Revelation 6, I'm sorry, Revela yeah, Revelation 6, 15 to 17, the wicked will be crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, while the righteous will be looking up and saying, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. So we will self-select. Will we be calling for the rocks, or will we be looking up for the, for the king, who's our king, who's coming? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we read these verses and we try to put it all together in one grand picture, we are delighted with what we see about your character, about your love and your kindness. We know that there's a lot of people who have chosen to rebel against you. And we wonder sometimes exactly how they will all end up. But it seems clear that they will choose for themselves to rebel against you. And as they have chosen in the past, may we understand your love and your kindness through all of this. We thank you for this opportunity we've had to study the book of Isaiah. May it be, have drawn us closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.